How's it going guys? Anthony from Sales 4x4 and these are 10 things that you must consider before doing an engine conversion. Alright, so rule number one and probably the most important thing is cost. I'm just going to say off the bat, whatever you think it's going to cost and you've done all your calculations and all your spreadsheets and tied up all the parts and whatever you think, double it and that way you're safe because you might not reach double but you're definitely going to go over 1.5 what you think it is or already, I can guarantee you. I'm currently at what I budgeted for with my spreadsheet and I got all the tally of all the prices and whatever I thought, I'm currently at that figure right now and I've got basically a Flintstone machine. The engine's nothing's connected, but it's in there. I've just done suspension, brakes, engine, gearbox. That's really it, and I'm already at that figure. So you might say I didn't budget correctly, and probably I didn't, but I went through everything, but there's so many things that you don't even consider that you need to buy to make something like this work and other things that you have to do, which I'll go through in this video. So yeah, stick around for that. And that brings me to point two, which is you've got to think of the effect on the other components. So you can't just go and drop a thousand horsepower motor in and help hope everything else is going to be sweet. You obviously then the gearbox is going to be the next weak point. So you have to upgrade that. And then you move down the line, your drive shafts. Like I'm going to have to get custom drive shafts made to handle the power and also a different thing because of the lengths, but whatever, you get the point. Same with this, brakes, whatever it is. You follow the power down the line, all has to be upgraded. Because if you just do this and you leave out that, well, you're obviously going to just snap that the first time you go out, which you want to avoid doing. So you might as well not do it at all or you do it properly. So that's one thing you've got to consider. The next thing you've got to think about is how does this new engine uh, integrate with your factory cluster or your wiring harness or the ECU? So um, these days it's pretty good because you can get quite common swaps that have pre made harnesses and things, but then again, they're not always the best, so you're better off making a custom harness, which can be pretty pricey. But yeah, if you want your original cluster to work, you need to get an adapter or make something custom to get that to work. Or these days, most people, which is what I'm doing, just getting rid of the whole factory cluster and swapping it out with one of these dashes. That's expensive as well. A decent dash runs between a thousand bucks to five grand. Depends what brand, the size and all that. You know, you can get some cheap ones out there. And there's another expense that you probably don't think about. If it doesn't work with your factory cluster, um, does your harness, is it plug and play? Does it have to be custom made? Does, does someone have to come and rewire it? Do you know what you're doing? Oh, probably not. I don't know how to do it either. Um, you're probably best to get someone that knows what they're doing to do it. And then if you want to try and match that up with your factory harness, you have to integrate it or do what I'm doing. You get rid of it all, get a PDM unit, and then you have to basically rewire the entire car, which is what I'm doing. So literally every single wire comes out, get this new unit, which controls even your headlights, your aircon, whatever, plus it's integrated with the ECU as well. So obviously that's a lot more expensive than the other ones, but it makes it simpler. And also if you want to race your car, for example, diagnosing problems that come up is very easy to find. You plug your computer in, you know. Otherwise you could be chasing the electrical gremlin all the time. You're always chasing the electrical gremlin, you're tuning it. This is not getting power. Why is that? Oh, this fuse is blown, you don't know. You know, you rather have the PDM there, you scan it, well, you plug your computer in, it tells you the problem straight away, you know, for example. So it depends what type of a conversion you want to go. Obviously, each person wants to go to a different level. So things to think about, do your homework, do your research, and obviously find the best cost-effective thing um, for your conversion. So the fourth thing you need to consider is your engine position, which you basically got to start with engine mount. So are you going to be bolt-in mounts, that bolt-in that have a set position of the motor? Are you going to have to cut them off and re-weld them? It's like what I've done. Um, and then your motor can either move forward, back, left, right, whatever. Let's say if it moves forward, um, maybe drag your whole gearbox forward or back or whatever, then you need to get a new gearbox cross member to make it work because it doesn't mount in the factory position. Same with the drive shafts. If the gearbox is further back, you need a shorter drive shaft because you've got a shorter distance. Because all these things need to be fabricated and planned for, and those things take time, which brings me to the fifth point, which is time frame. And similar to my first rule, whatever you think it's going to cost, double it. However long you think it's going to take, triple it. Because these days, and this really got impacted by COVID, I know that's kind of over now, but for some reason, delays are still there. Getting parts can take months. Like I waited for my gearbox like six months, for example. Uh, or the motor can take three months, four months, you don't know. You could need this part from overseas or whatever. You get what I'm trying to say. It could take a long time. 
You need to get things fabricated. People are booked out. You need to tie it from this shop to that shop. You need to make a booking. You need to save up money or, you know, you order the wrong part and then you got to go through the process of returning, get something new. You get where I'm going with this. It can take a lot of time. So never tell yourself, oh, I'm just going to take it off the road for a month, put it in the garage, I'll get it done, it'll be right, it'll be, right. You know, it'll be good, I've got plenty of time. Because something will go wrong every time and there'll be something you have not thought of that will be a curveball that you then have to deal with. There's been a lot of that on this and previous projects and that's just how the car industry is. Modified cars never go to plan. So give yourself ample time and don't rush it. Enjoy the process. The sixth thing you need to consider is your brakes. So you've upgraded all this power now. You've upgraded the diffs, the gearbox, everything. You're making 1,000 horsepower, whatever you're doing. How are you going to stop? If you've got no good brakes, it's no good because you need more power means you need better brakes because you're going to get at a quicker speed, at a faster time, so you need a brake at a faster time. So obviously, don't cut short on brakes. I reckon go all out on brakes. Again, it's your life at the end of the day, so you want to take care of yourself, you need to stop. You now have the confidence that you know you can stop if you need to stop. I don't think, I think it's enough said. Pretty self-explanatory. The next thing you need to consider is all the custom work that needs to be done. And there's going to be a lot of custom work that needs to be done. Think about it. You're putting in an engine into a car that was never designed to have that engine there. So you need to make it work. Now, a good skill to have is welding, you know, fabricating, the whole thing like that. But a lot of people don't have that equipment. Myself, I have basic tools. I can't do all these crazy things that these people do. So, like intercooler piping, who's going to do that? You know, um, fabricators are expensive. Who's going to do your exhaust? If you need to make custom engine mounts or intercooler brackets or drilling holes for intercooler pipes, I'm sure a lot of you guys are pretty handy, can do most of it yourself. But if you can't do everything yourself like me, you don't need to outsource it. So you've got to, again, how much is it going to cost you? It's expensive. You're paying labor for someone to do these things plus you're buying the parts. So think about the cost. Think about the time. How are you going to get it to these shops? Um, if they don't come to you, you need to tow it somewhere. So then you need to consider all the tow trucks. Like, yeah, I'll get into that, but yeah, there's a lot of tow trucks involved and trailers and all that kind of stuff you need to consider. Another very important thing to consider is the legality of your swap. So obviously to get an engine swap, they're all illegal unless you get them engineered. So I'm going to get this engineered. I've already spoken to an engineer before I begin my build and I highly recommend speaking to an engineer before you even buy the car, before you do anything, because he will tell you if you can do it or you can't. There's very specific rules that you can do and you can't do. For example, in this car I wanted to widen my track, um, I said, can you do it with offset wheels? He said, yes you can, but you can have 25 mil on each side, so 50 mil total um, with, with wheels um, to extend the track. If you want to go more than that, you need to get a diff. So what have I done? I said, I obviously want to be legal, so I swapped out the diff for a GU diff, it bolts right in, and it's wider. I can't remember exactly how much wider it is, I think it's like 80 mil wider, and then I can go another 50 mil with the wheels. So. You can do it with wheel spaces, which we all know it's illegal, but what I'm getting at is you can do something the wrong way and then you get an engineer later and then you want to change it and then you'll end up paying for it double. So if you speak to him before you do anything, you know what he wants, do that, keep him happy, you're happy, everything goes smoothly, car gets engineered, it's all roadworthy, no dramas, get pulled over, here's the documents and that's it. So please don't cut corners, just do it right once and you won't have any headaches. The last thing you want to do is get it defected and then go through all that hassle. So please just speak to an engineer and do it the right way. We're nearly at the end, only two more points left. So point number nine is transport. I briefly touched on it before. Um, basically, obviously, how are you going to get the car around? It's not working like now. It doesn't drive, it's a Flintstone mobile. Uh, if I need to get it to a shop, I need to tow it there. Am I going to use a car trailer? Am I going to get a tow truck? What am I going to do? Both those things are expensive. If you have a car trailer, great, but probably most of the people don't have a car trailer or don't have anywhere to store it or whatever. So you need to get a tow truck or rent a trailer every single time. And these things can add up. If it's once or twice, it's all right, but you have to do it 10, 15 times over the thing, there's a couple of grand there, you know? So all these things add up and think about it. Where's the shop it needs to go to and calculate that when you try and figure out the cost. All right, lucky last, point number 10. And this is also very important. It's the build triangle. You guys have probably seen it before. I'll put it up on the screen now. So you've got cheap, fast, reliable. You can only pick two of those things. You can't have all three. If you get something reliable and fast, it won't be cheap. If you get something reliable and cheap, it won't be fast. If you get something fast and cheap, it won't be reliable. 
you get the ID. So very important. Think about which way you want to go with the build. But my personal thing is I'm a big fan of reliability. So if you have a certain amount of money to spend, you rather make less power reliably than try and push the limits, break it, and then have no car for six months where you save up more money to try and fix it. So your choice at the end of the day, but I know which way I'm going. So live by that motto and you'll be pretty good when it comes to doing engine conversions. Unfortunately, that concludes the episode, but I hope you guys learned something from this. This is from my experience and my mate's experience. Obviously, I'm not a professional. I don't know everything. It's just from my own experience and what I've heard from other people as well. Um, obviously, there's things you guys know that I don't know, but I hope you guys learned something and take something away from this video. So yeah, if you guys enjoyed, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. And make sure you follow our TikTok and Instagram accounts to keep updated because we post a lot more on there than we do on YouTube. Even though YouTube, I'm going to be putting more videos on there. If you want to stay updated, yeah, check out definitely Instagram and TikTok. So yeah, hope you guys have a great day and we'll see you guys next time.